Hello, and we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Prepare for Success, GMP Cell Banks as part of a staged, standardized, platform-style cell production process. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher, manufacturer of GMP Gipco Cell Therapy Systems reagents for pluripotent derived cell therapy development. For more information on our sponsor, please visit them at thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. You can submit questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh on your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have experienced technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, simply click on the support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right of your presentation window and follow the process for obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Benjamin Fryer. Ben is the CEO and co-founder of Pluristics Incorporated, providing GMP pre-expanded pluripotent stem cells, contract development services, and consultancy for groups and company developing cell and tissue therapies. Ben has almost 25 years of experience as a leader and scientist in large pharma, academia, and startup companies developing combination products and cell therapies. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our presenter. Ben, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, uh, Ms. Valdez. I'd like to thank Ms. Valdez from LabRoots and also Kyle Berry and Amanda Summers from Thermo Fisher Scientific for the opportunity to present here today to, to all of you. Um, so today, as was mentioned, I'll be talking about manufacturing GMP cell banks as part of a staged uh, process um, and why it is so important and how that's incorporated into cell therapy manufacturing. Um, and we'll also talk really about the, the critical reagents, uh, maybe most importantly, the, 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 the quality of the reagents and raw materials, also known as ancillary materials, that have to go in um, early in the development process and why it is so important to incorporate quality materials early on. So as an, as an overview, um, I think most people that are listening to this webinar know that um, pluripotent stem cells, either from human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, have been um, described in literature for at least the last uh, 12 years for induced pluripotent stem cells and over 20 years ago from the, the, the groundbreaking work from Jamie Thompson in the late 90s uh, showing that human embryonic stem cells could be derived and expanded. Um, based on that work, there's been a lot of uh, proof of concept studies that have been done either with human embryonic stem cells uh, or with induced pluripotent stem cells, also just called PSCs here, um, pluripotent stem cells make cells or tissues that can be transplanted into animal models of disease and can essentially cure uh, those diseases. That includes things like uh, uh, blindness, uh, diabetes, heart disease, uh, spinal cord injuries, um, potentially things like Parkinson's. Um, uh, so of course these, these cures or treatments are, are very exciting, but translating the promise of those PSC-derived therapies to reality for patients requires really a rigorous um, and often expensive and definitely highly regulated manufacturing that is broken up into unit operations. So you don't just start, um, start growing cells, make your product and, and ship it out. You have unit operations that, that, that define how that process is manufactured. And it all starts with making um, the starting material. That is to say the master cell bank and then from that you would make working cell banks. And as part of that, you need to make sure that those are high-quality cell banks um, that uh, start with high-quality starting material that will meet um, uh, today's regulatory requirements. But because the process for development is so long, you need to consider that they might need to exceed the current regulatory requirements to meet tomorrow's 
uh, regulatory requirements. And as part of that, integrating high quality raw materials, ancillary materials, and in this case we'll call them ancillary raw materials, into the product development and manufacturing starting at the very beginning with the cell source and the manufacturing of the master cell bank. In doing this, it reduces process risk, um, regulatory risk, and long term it reduces um, the economic risk of potentially delayed uh, product release or potentially the company or the sponsors not having enough money to continue. So where are we right now in terms of pluripotent stem cell derived therapies? Um, when we look at the, the, the state of the art for other biological manufacturing, that is to say antibodies, um, proteins for say enzyme replacement or um, vaccines or even um, virus made for other cell therapy manufacturing for things like CAR-T, um, there's a host of, of, of cell lines that are available and that are already GMP and are ready to go. Um, so that would be things like CHO or HEK for, for uh, protein production, CHO for antibodies, um, HEK and uh, Vero cells for virus manufacturing. And they are essentially plug and play, meaning you can go to a contract manufacturer and there's a host of them in the United States and in Europe and Asia, and they will um, help you to, to develop a process that is defined um, relatively affordable. They'll start with mostly, if not all, animal origin free raw materials, AOF, um, and they will make you, starting from one of those lines that is already GMP, um, they will make you a seed bank and you can pick a clone, make a master cell bank, and then uh, proceed from there. And all of this can be routinely done um, from derivation as a fee for service. So you could have a virtual company and do it all yourself um, from basically an office um, and have a contract manufacturer do it all. That is really not the case right now with pluripotent stem cell derived therapies that were much earlier in the, in the, the, the development phase for that as, a, as an industry. Right now, every trial sponsor, whether it's a university, a nonprofit, or a for-profit company, currently has to develop and use their own process. And this can be inconsistent. So even if you have the same starting material, the same genetic material, um, whether, let's, for example, let's say uh, you have an H1 line uh, that you could get um, as a starting material from, from Y-cell, Different expansion processes by different companies or different labs will give different um, downstream uh, processing uh, and differentiation to a product cell. And another thing to keep in mind that's a problem within the field right now is the high cost of raw materials. And the raw materials themselves are often research use only. There are a couple companies, for example, Thermo Fisher um, Stem Cell Technologies, they have some GMP or clinical grade material that is available for use early on, um, but many other manufacturers don't have that. So it's something to keep in mind. And when you're making these starting material, you need to make sure that you're considering um, the, the, the life cycle. So for example, if you're developing the product, it can take five to 10 years from the time you start the development process, the early preclinical studies, till the time you get um, FDA approval for marketing. Then from there, you're looking at 10 to potentially up to 30 plus years for your product life cycle. So at the minimum, you're looking at 15 years of, of supporting manufacturing from a, from a single bank, and ideally up to, if you're lucky, 35, 40 years for supporting the product life cycle. So the underlying master cell bank has to be designed to keep that in mind. Can you, can you make enough without changing the bank? And the reason why changing the bank is so problematic is for given the inconsistencies within pluripotent stem cells, the, the early bank is, is the, the foundation. It's what you build on, and you don't want to change it. The FDA requires, essentially, biological manufacturing to be um, a defined process because the end products are often hard to fully characterize. So changing, they say, the process is the product, which means if you change the process, you're essentially changing the product. And if you do that, you need to demonstrate comparability. There's three levels of doing that. One would be just in vitro assays. Another could be in vivo assays in an animal model. But if the FDA determines that the process has changed sufficiently um, and they want full proof of comparability, you could end up having to do an additional clinical trial to show comparability. So changing um, a process has its own internal risks. And the, the, the most expensive outcome could be redoing a clinical trial. So starting with a good master cell bank is, is, is really important. So when we look at the, 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 the current uh, state of clinical trials and regenerative medicine right now, there are 875 companies, so most of, just over half of those are located in North America. And those companies and other um, uh, universities and nonprofits are running about a total of 977 clinical trials um, in the regenerative medicine space. Of those, about 60 of them are with 
pluripotent stem cell derived cells, pork tissues, and this is from clinicaltrials.gov. So uh, there's a lot of people that are in the space, um, but it's, I'd say, still early, and most of those trials are in phase one or phase, early phase two. And they start, for the pluripotent stem cell derived uh, therapies, they start with either one of two sources. Um, on the left, you can see embryonic stem cells. On the right would be induced pluripotent stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are, come from uh, donated in vitro fertilization material that would be otherwise discarded. Um, usually the, the, the donors have uh, elected to, to either dispose of the material or donate it. And so uh, it's plated out, the inner cell mass grows out, you get um, a cell line, and that cell line can be expanded and banked all in a laboratory under controlled conditions. And that's where human embryonic stem cells come from. One line comes from one embryo. Um, when you're working with induced pluripotent stem cells, those can come from any nucleated cell, any somatic cell with a nucleus, and there are multiple methods to, to manufacture them. Uh, there's, you can use virus, multiple viral sources, lenti, uh, adeno, uh, retrovirus. Um, those are a little bit less likely to be used for, for uh, clinical grade product, but right now um, using plasmid or episomes is, a, is a, an alternative. and. Of course, uh, direct inoculation with protein or mRNA or a mix to uh, induce pluripotency in, a, in an adult cell back to a pluripotent state. In the end, embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells, if they are of good quality, they should be basically indistinguishable. It shouldn't be easy to tell where they came from. Um, they should have the same expansion properties. They, the, the banking processes between them should be the same. So therefore, the reagents and the raw materials that are used for that process should be applicable to both types of cells. The phenotype, um, what you would consider pluripotency, should be the same, and they should differentiate relatively similarly, um, knowing that there is differences from line to line, um, but they should be able to form all three lineages of ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. In the end, those, those pluripotent stem cells are what are used in the pluripotent stem cell field. So as you're taking this and you're developing your product, um, starting with these uh, pluripotent stem cells, you're going to have to follow, if you're working with the FDA, uh, their phased development scheme. Um, it starts first with proof of concept, and this would be the same whether you're working with a, a drug or a small molecule or a biological or a cell therapy. Um, you'd have to show that you've got some proof of concept, that this should have some efficacious benefit um, that you could extrapolate for, for a human being. Um, then you would move into your preclinical studies, uh, which most critically involves um, pharmacology and toxicology, and for cell therapies, those are often mixed. For um, biologicals and small molecules, they can often be done separately, but for, for, for preclinical studies in cell therapy, they're often combined into the same animal model or multiple animal models. That package is then put together along with other work, um, including CMC and your clinical trial plan planning, and you file an IND, indication for a new drug, and if you get the green light and approval from the FDA, you can begin a series of escalating clinical trial phases, starting with phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, and at the end of all that, you'll have enough data to show that it's most importantly safe, but also importantly efficacious, and then you can file for a biological licensing approval, which gives you a BLA and approval to sell your product, at which point you'd have po phase four post-marketing surveillance. For the for the topic of a, of a master cell bank, where it's probably most important to think about this, is the first four bullets. Um, you have the opportunity to have what used to be called a pre-pre-IND meeting, um, now called an interact meeting with the, the FDA, where you can get some of their early um, advice on how to develop your product and, and the, a few key questions that you should probably answer in advance of your pre-IND meeting. At the, the point when you're prepared to do your pre-IND meeting, um, you want to make sure that you've got um, an idea of what your product is going to look like. And uh, you don't necessarily have to have a master cell bank, a GMP master cell bank at this point, but you need to have a good idea of how you're going to make it because um, at this point you're going to get approval from the FDA for what you believe your acceptable toxicology and pharmacology animal models are. And uh, this is critical because this is a very expensive process. It could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to run these studies. And they have something that money can't buy, which is time embedded in them. So if you're going to use a pluripotent stem cell-derived um, therapy, you're going to have to do some sort of uh, tumor study or terato uh, teratoma formation study 
and this is often to the life of the animal. So that can be anywhere between 6 to 12 months of waiting to see if animals develop tumors. And that is required to start with your, your master cell bank. Uh, the FDA, as you can see, the link is below. They require the manufacturing process of the cellular product used in the preclinical study should be as similar to the intended clinical product as possible, meaning you should start with your master cell bank um, that you're going to use for your clinical grade manufacturing. Um, so you don't want to, you can't do those studies until you have that master cell bank. And so you can see how early on you're locked in. You haven't even filed your IND and you need to have locked in one of your manufacturing processes. Once you've got all those pharmacology and toxicology studies, you'll file your IND and you'll be able to move into manufacturing for your phase one clinical trial. The FDA has an, uh, uh, an explicit and implicit expectation that you will improve your manufacturing process um, from your phase one clinical trials through to the end of your phase 2B clinical trials. Um, at the beginning, before you begin phase 3, you have to have locked your manufacturing process, but that allows you some uh, downstream uh, improvements. But the one thing that is very difficult to improve uh, is the master cell bank. Um, although you can improve lots of other things by the end of phase 2, um, it's really hard to, to make any changes to the master cell bank because that essentially introduces comparability risk. So. Um, when you think about this, if you kind of like break it up into what I've called um, uh, process units or unit operations, um, when you're doing the research work, it really is almost seamless. You have your starting material, uh, might be a cell bank or a cell line that's uh, floating around the lab. Maybe um, uh, researchers, grad students, postdocs have traded the line around. Everybody's got their own so-called bank or master cell bank that they use. Uh, passage number may not be well tracked. Um, uh, the processing is not necessarily consistent, but everybody seems to get a pretty good um, result, at, which is why you're, you're moving forward and, and trying to raise money to, to make this into a clinical grade process. You expand the cells, most, you, know, you might seed them a little uh, lighter one day or a little heavier another day to make sure that you don't have to come in and pass cells on a Saturday or a Sunday. And at the end, you have a differentiation process, which works pretty well on a small scale. And then those are put into either just in vitro studies or they're put into in vivo studies in your animal model. And um, it's relatively seamless. It's often done by one, maybe two, three people, but it's a, it's a small team at a minimum, or at a maximum, I should say. When you move into clinical grade manufacturing, um, that, uh, that early part, that starting material, is broken up really into three uh, unit operations. And it's very tightly regulated. And ideally, it should be locked early in development. That's derivation, so if it's an uh, embryonic stem cell, um, it, that would be anywhere from uh, getting the donation of the blastocyst or the embryo. Uh, in the case of an induced pluripotent stem cell, it would be um, the, how you're manufacturing the, the IPS line from the very beginning. What are the materials you use to, to derive that, that induced pluripotent stem cell? The expansion process then um, can be broken up into a seed material and frozen, and you can characterize and pick your, your starting material. Once you've picked it, then you make your master cell bank, and uh, all of this is relatively tightly locked, and this should all be done with, with high-quality ancillary materials, high-quality raw materials, so that you don't have to go back and repeat this later on if there's any questions about the quality of those materials. Once you move into the later stages, shown in pink on the right, which would be making the working cell bank, um, then thawing a working cell bank, which could contain anywhere between 1 and 5 million cells in the vial. You'll expand that up, um, and the seed train really just means you're, you're growing up lots of pluripotent stem cells for your eventual differentiation process. So you might need to make hundreds of millions of cells or even potentially billions of, of pluripotent stem cells. Um, at that point, you're ready to differentiate those cells into your product, and then you have finish and fill, uh, whether it's uh, cold stored and delivered directly to the clinic or you have cryopreservation somewhere in that process. And then that's delivered to the, to the, to the patient or to the, uh, the point of care. Um, all that in pink, you could potentially make process changes and optimization prior to process lock in, a, in advance of your registration trial. Uh, which is usually phase three, but if you have, say, an orphan designation or an advanced regenerative medicine application that's approved, um, that could potentially be phase 2B or something like that. But you need to potentially uh, optimize the process from the point of the master cell bank derivation, and you have room and time for that. You don't necessarily have it for the, the, the banking process of the master cell bank. And so if we look at, like, really what goes into the workflow that's, that's used for making a master cell bank for an intended clinical product, um, it has to be made under GMP, uh, good manufacturing process practice. And um, this starts 
first and foremost by where you're going to do it. Um, it has to be done in a clean environment, and that's because most of the operations for making a master cell bank are open. Open would be just kind of your standard six-wheel plate or a T-flask. Um, uh, you know, you've got pipettings that are done open. Um, in, in more advanced biological processing, often things are closed and considered to be sterile. That can be done in, in, a, in, a, in a room environment, but for any sort of aseptic processing, it has to be done in a biosafety cabinet, which would be an ISO 5 environment inside of an, a clean room, which would be an ISO 7 environment. That room and that, that biosafety cabinet have to have HEPA filtered air, and the, the environment is monitored by things like settling plates, um, active particle monitors, and uh, culture, uh, culture plates for monitoring for both just total particle burden and uh, colony forming units. Any sort of instruments that are used in that environment have to be qualified for, for use and for work by installation, operational and performance qualification. Any of the operators and verifiers who work in that environment have to be gowning qualified, um, qualified to be in the room, and also qualified to perform the, the unit operations that are going to be done. And all of that has to be captured within a batch record. That is a, a, either a paper or an electronic document that uh, verifies and tracks all the work that was done and was uh, con so that there's a record of what was done. And there also has to be a, a system to track if any sort of um, deviations occur, if anything that was unplanned or not captured within the batch record to determine a, on a risk analysis if it, if it impacted the quality of the product. Anything that comes in and is used in that environment has to have traceability. So that would be any sort of raw materials uh, or excipients that are going to come in. And that means that the product has to come in with a certificate of analysis, a C of A. And they're held in the warehouse in a quarantine area until they're approved for use. And that provides incoming goods control for anything that's coming in. And uh, one thing that's not on the slide, but is to keep in mind, is that um, uh, any sort of supplier is often audited, or usually should be audited, either with a paper audit, indicating that there's some um, quality uh, supply chain system used by the and manufacturing system used by the supplier, or uh, potentially depending on, on the risk of the, the incoming product or the, the phase of the manufacturing, um, an, in, an on-site audit by quality assurance from the sponsor. Another thing that to keep in mind is that, that the donor tissue, the cell itself, whether it's a human embryonic stem cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell, you need to make sure that you have fully consented donor release of that material. And this is critical because in today's day and age where uh, genome gene sequencing and identity is so easily performed, um, you could quite easily, assuming that everything's been anonymized and uh, randomized and you have fully donor consent, that donor could be traced um, and very easily. Uh, and so you could imagine how family might want to make sure that, that they were uh, compensated if the, uh, the donor consent wasn't fully in place. Um, and then finally, uh, so assuming you have all those things, you've got a fully consented donor, including commercial rights to use those cells, uh, all raw material traceability, clean room, et cetera. You've made your bank. Now the bank has to be released based on assays for, for, for four or more things. Uh, these are the key four, safety, identity, purity, and viability. And so when you're making a master cell bank and also a working cell bank, these, these, um, these criteria hold for both, both form. Um, you'll have to test for phenotype and identity a purity of the, of the bank, the carry type, meaning it has to be genetically stable. Uh, it has to have uh, only one donor, and that donor has to be human. There's multiple ways to do that, but right now for, for human pluripotent stem cells, probably the best way to do that would be to use short tandem repeat. You test for uh, sterility, uh, and that would include mycoplasma, um, uh, fungus, and bacterial growth, and then also endotoxin, um, which can be either a result of any sort of risk from your, your raw materials or uh, bacterial growth within the, the, the product. Then the product before it's frozen and after it's frozen, you would check for viability, usually by a qualified method, which could include things like dye exclusion, and some of those are old tested methods like tripan blue, ethidium bromide, or propridium iodide. There are a lot of other methods, but in the FDA requirement is that the bank after thaw is greater than 70% viable. And then finally, and maybe most important, you need to make sure that the, the, the bank functions as you would want it to in your process, and that would be sponsor-specific um, differentiation to whatever it is your fate of interest. Um, 
And so that's for releasing a master or working cell bank. A master bank has a, a deeper dive. Um, so when you're releasing it, you'll also have to look for any sort of um, viral potential contaminant or infection in that line. Um, there's qPCR assays for the top ones, including things like HIV. Um, there's RT-PCR for RNA viruses, like HCV. Uh, you have then uh, for, and of course, because they're PCR, they are pl um, primer-based, so you know the sequence, but then there's also the risk that there could be viruses that you don't even know about, so that includes adventitious viral contaminants for nonspecific reverse transcriptase. And then there's in vitro and in vivo assays that are, that are intended to determine if there's any virus in the, the, the bank. So um, you would co-culture with MRC5, Vero, or, or A549 cells and do an in vitro assay. Um, you'd also do an in vivo assay. There's uh, direct inoculation of, of eggs or, or rodents um, to look for, for viral contaminants. Um, also, if your product has ever come in contact with any sort of bovine material, you'd also have to potentially do bovine virus detection. And, um, and if you have uh, used anything that was porcine, like uh, trip, uh, trypsin, uh, derived from, from uh, pig gut, or you've co-cultured them with mouse feeders, you'd have to do porcine or murine virus panels. So it's really important that you have, uh, is, if you can get animal origin free, uh, recombinant and human materials only, then um, you will reduce the risk of having to do any additional viral testing. It's also really important that you understand the material supply chain of your suppliers. Well, how did they make those materials? Because that's where additional risk comes in. Any of that raw material contact um, puts that, 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 that master cell bank and therefore your entire process and potentially company at risk if you don't have high quality materials coming in. Um, so I've given you a lot of tables give you a picture just to kind of describe this. So like I said, we're looking at unit operations, um, a cell banking process. You start um, at unit one, and that's really making your, your seed material, your seed bank. And with the with embryonic stem cell, it starts with, a, with an embryo or a blastocyst. It's cultured out. And um, in the case of induced pluripotent stem cells, it'd be your donor's somatic cells that are induced back to pluripotency. You might either bulk passage or single cell clone and then you would have potentially one or more uh, seed banks. So you could take those banks, and before you move on to unit operation two, which is the actual master cell bank, you would take that material and you would test it. You'd want to make sure that it was genetically stable. If it's an iPS cell, you didn't have any, uh, uh, say, CMIC or OCT4 incorporation into the wrong places. Um, you'd want to make sure that it was it had a nice population doubling time. It didn't grow too fast. It didn't grow too slow. It was a nice, uh, stable line, and probably most importantly, if you're making a product, that it differentiates to the fate that you want. So now you've got a seed bank, and let's say that's somewhere between 5 and 20 vials. Um, you're going to take one of those vials, and you're going to return to the GMB facility, and you're going to make your master cell bank. And that's going to take somewhere between, let's say, 2 to 5 passages. You start in a small, uh, either a 6-well plate or a small tea flask. You can grow that out into a cell factory or a cell stack. And um, or multiple tea flasks, and you'll have enough cells to make uh, 100 or more vials of a master cell bank. That can then be used, um, thought, and used to make a working cell bank in nearly the same process as the master cell bank. And in this case, when we talk about the, the, the lifeline or the lifetime, uh, life cycle of the product, um, 100 vials of a master cell bank can make um, about 100,000 total product lots because each vial of master cell bank can make about 100 vials or more of working cell bank. So you just multiply that out, assuming that each, each working cell bank vial can make a product lot. Um, that's 10,000 possible product lots from relatively small banks. And assuming you do two production runs uh, a month or just a little bit more, that's about 25 um, production runs a year, which would be a really high number. <laughs> Normally you'd want to do a lot less than that, but let's say you're, you're really running full gun and uh, full bore and you've got, you've got 25 product runs, uh, product lots being manufactured year. Off of this simple scheme, that would be enough for 40 years of your product life cycle. So it's enough to support a long, long-term uh, manufacturing process. So just in summary, you've got your seed material process, uh, starting either with an embryo or a small amount of donor cells. Um, you're going to make somewhere less than, say, 20 vials. Um, you're going to check those, those vials in that bank for uh, do they work in your process? Are they, are they the right material? Then you're going to have to release them. Um, 
you're going to want to know in the case of an iPS cell if you have any sort of residual virus or plasmid incorporation or episomes left in the, the cytoplasm. Um, you're going to check to make sure are they, st are they pluripotent, are they genetically stable, and of course are they clean, are they sterile, and do they function in your process. Then you pick one, you move into your master cell bank, and now you're doing this much larger um, uh, release specification, compendio release for sterility, endotoxin, mycoplasma, um, checking for their pluripotency, uh, are they are they the right identity? Are they genetically stable? Do they function? And in the case of iPS cells, uh, do they have any sort of insertions that you don't want? And then the working cell bank is a sub subset of those release specifications. And in each case, you don't have to make a lot of vials. I mean, this isn't a, a large uh, production process. The thing about it is it takes a lot of time. And uh, as you, you can see here on the third or fourth line, time to completion. You know, it could take 14 to 21 days or more for the seed material. You know, 20, 20 plus days, potentially early, around 20 days for a master cell bank, and another, say, 15 to 20 days for your working cell bank. If you add that all up, you're looking at just in time alone spent in a GMP facility of about seven to eight weeks. And so this is expensive. GMP facilities are not cheap. Operations are not cheap. And so you need to plan these out very carefully in advance um, because you don't want to change the master cell bank. Uh, the cost even if you do it early on, is quite expensive, a uh, GMP suite with reagents and labor. Um, and I, I think these are on low-end numbers. They're tens of thousands of dollars. Um, the actual bank release testing for the, the, the tables I showed previously, those are hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they're quite expensive. And um, the time is something that money just can't buy time. Um, the, the, just to generate and test those cell banks can take nine months or longer, including the, the, the tumor studies that are required for your toxicology studies to, to sponsor and uh, support an IND filing. And so the risk to the sponsor if the cell bank isn't done properly are if you change it, um, cell banks by nature are inherently variable in performance. You could end up having to go back and re-optimize your manufacturing for your, your, your differentiation, and that cost could be millions of dollars. Uh, the additional cost could be in, in comparability requirements that, that any regulatory agency might require. And so if you imagine that you've got a, a product that could be a blockbuster drug, meaning it makes a billion dollars a year or more, and you end up taking a nine or 12 month delay because you had to remake a master cell bank, that's a billion dollars in cost. It's, uh, it's money that actually hasn't been actu realized, but um, it could be the difference between uh, success and failure of a company, especially if you have a competitor that you're neck and neck with and they get there first. Um, you're, 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 you could end up uh, losing completely. So just to review the risks to the master cell bank, and on the, the slide after this is really how to mitigate these risks. Um, you want to make sure you have proper donor consent for the incoming raw material, so it's, that is the cell itself. Uh, you want to make sure that any sort of raw materials or ancillary materials that are used in your making your bank are of high quality. So if you're going to use feeder cells, I'd recommend uh, GMP human feeder cells. Um, if you're going to use, uh, well, I would recommend against mouse feeder cells. Uh, you can use them. For example, H1 and H9 have been um, used for human clinical trials. Um, but they are not, um, they're, they're considered xenogenic lines, meaning they've been in contact with another species' uh, cells. And so uh, it's not something that you'd want to do if you can avoid it, but it's not a, it's not a game stopper. Um, if you're using any sort of bovine com component in your process, uh, FBS or bovine albumin, you want to make sure it comes from a qualified herd, meaning a USDA-approved herd that has a certificate of origin, and this is because of uh, prion disease. There is no assay for it. The only way to prevent it um, in your manufacturing is to, is to start with high-quality material. And if you can't prove that later on, that could be a game stopper. So uh, TSE has a real uh, risk to your, your process and your product. Um, the media. Um, depending on how it's made, um, there's uh, in warehoused um, actual mice in the warehouse can can transmit virus to the components, and so you want to use uh, media from a reputable vendor who actually tests for that. Uh, your growth factors should be all ideally human recombinant and, if possible, animal origin free, and that includes for pluripotent media things like insulin, uh, BFGF, and TGF beta, and other growth factors that can be in the media. Your small molecules, if possible, should be filtered, and your DMSO should be of pharma grade. Uh, cell culture plastic, um, usually if you're working from something like Nalgene Nunk or Corning, you're going to get a very high quality product, but some people use uh, cheaper uh, sources. Um, I'd recommend against it. Go with a, with, a, with a reputable old and trusted vendor. If you're using a coating, which most pluripotent stem cells require a coating, um, 
avoid Matrigel if you can. That's a, that's a really a RUO product. You want to go with something that is um, manufactured uh, fit for purpose, and that would be a recombinant product or a synthetic product like RGD or recombinant uh, laminin. And for any sort of human donor materials, you want to make sure that you have a certificate of analysis that they are clean um, for any sort of viruses. And um, just keep in mind that the real risk here is is two things, uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, the prion disease, um, and viral contamination. And you can test for vi viral contamination later on, but you can't test for TSE. So you need to make sure that anything that's made, um, any product that's made with bovine source in your supply chain or that is a bovine source material that you're using directly has come from a USDA certified herd or New Zealand, Australia herd. So in terms of how do you mitigate this, um, the USP, uh, has a very clear guidance on this. Um, the 1043 was recently issued, uh, I think a couple of years back, and it, and it talks about how to incorporate ancillary materials for cell, gene, and tissue engineered products into your manufacturing. And they, they, they do this by providing a four-tier table system. So tier one is the lowest risk, tier four is the highest risk. And tier four really in, includes a lot of the things I'm talking about um, previously, like um, bovine-derived materials, um, uh, any sort of Xeno product, anything that's not intended for um, potentially incorporation into a, to a, uh, an infusible or directly treatable product, uh, things that are for diagnostics, say, um, or for research would be in Tier 3 or Tier 4. And they provide guidance for qualifying um, the use of materials. So if a material is, say, research use only, but you have to use it because there is no GMP or cell therapy grade product, um, they provide guidance for qualifying that material to use in manufacturing your cell gene uh, or tissue engineered product. And that is uh, key because, you know, early on the FDA and other regulatory agencies rec uh, recognize that there is a risk. Um, you can't always get a GMP reagent if you're, if you're pushing the envelope and trying to make a new therapy. They do expect that you work with a supplier that is committed to improving their quality systems in parallel as you advance through your phased development to uh, to commercial manufacturing for, for human use products. And that means you really want to make sure from the very beginning you work to integrate high quality raw materials and ancillary materials into your manufacturing process from the very first seed bank onward. And that means if you can, use GMP or an animal origin free products as soon as possible, especially for your cell banking. And source all your raw materials if, as, if possible from suppliers experienced in supporting cell therapy development. Uh, ideally, these should be stable, long-term partners because they're going to have to commit to, to supplying that product to you as long as you're making your product. Um, and if they do so, that will reduce your risk of potential disruptions, things like back orders. Um, I know if you're in a lab and something's back ordered in six weeks, it's, you know, it's a hassle. If you've got a GMP suite set up and you've got operators and you've paid for that time and you're back ordered on a critical reagent, uh, you have to pay for that time. That can cost a lot of money. Uh, product changes should be clearly communicated to you if you're using them, and you don't want to have to worry about any sort of discontinued products because that can, of course, uh, create great risk in your in your manufacturing system. And you want to identify, if possible, uh, more than one source for your raw materials. Um, ideally, at least two suppliers. Um, avoid sole supplier products if possible. I know that's not always possible, but but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it just reduces your risk as a manufacturer or as a sponsor. So in summary, um, I think I've hopefully communicated how important it is from seed material on through your master cell bank all the way through to end product manufacturing, how important it is, especially at the beginning, to use high quality raw materials from an established and reputable vendor as early as possible because those raw material risks extend throughout the supply chain and they put the entire uh, project and product at risk if they're not um, dealt with. You want to look and future forward planning. You want to know where you're going to be, where you want to be, knowing that it's going to take many years, and you want to anticipate increased regulatory stringency over time um, for your product. And so you don't just want to meet today's standards. You want to know that tomorrow's standards are going to be a little higher, and you want to try and meet those in advance so that you can at least pass the bar for tomorrow, even though you greatly exceed it today. And all of this, if you do this and put this in place now, you can avoid uh, the loss of time, money, and potentially catastrophic risk to your product or your company by generating a high quality seed and master cell banks in the beginning that can sustain the product throughout its life cycle. So 
my last slide, just a little bit about pluristics. Um, I won't talk too much about it, but I'd like to thank everybody who has uh, come today and, and uh, watched and listened to this talk. And if, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take any questions you have at this time. Thank you. And thank you, Ben, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Before I ask the final first question, we have a question for you. Have you worked in a GMP environment before? This question will now pop up on your screen, and thanks for your participation. So let's take a look at our first questions coming in from our audience. Ben, can you make a cell line GMP if it wasn't originally generated in a GMP environment? Um, yeah, it's an excellent question. So this is a common uh, question that's asked, and I think the, the answer right now I think is yes. So for example, the H9 line that is um, available from Y-Cell was made under, under research conditions, so that would have been considered a research master cell bank. Um, that, that, question, that, that, that bank has been um, used essentially as the seed bank, so as a unit operation, and that, that research master cell bank becomes the so-called seed material. Um, a vial of that is, is then transferred into a GMP environment, an entire batch record and process is developed around that, and then uh, it's manufactured and released. And there's um, essentially a risk assessment that has to be done on all the materials that were used to make that line in the beginning. So it's kind of a way of, of kind of figuring out what other additional viral panels you should, you should look for. Um, I guess the biggest risk with any sort of, with, with doing something in that manner, is that uh, you need to make sure you have early passage cells. Um, and it's actually not given that the FDA or other regulatory agencies um, will, will accept it by the time you get to filing your BLA. So you might be able to make your product early on, but um, you might be uh, essentially pigeonholed into a very small um, indication. So for example, if you wanted to go for, uh, show that you were making, let's say, neurons and you wanted to treat a specific type of blindness, you might only be able to use that product for that specific type of blindness um, to be able to add on indications or area, other therapeutic areas. You might not be able to do it because um, they would consider that product to be too high of risk. And so you'd end up basically having to restart the process. So I guess the question, the simple answer is yes. Um, it's possible to take a, a research bank and make it into a GMP master cell bank right now. Um, but I, I, I think if, if you can afford it, if it's possible, it's better to make the master cell bank um, from uh, a GMP source from the very, very beginning. Thank you, Ben. And is there a difference between a research master cell bank and a GMP master cell bank? And can a research bank be converted to GMP bank during development? Um, I would say probably um, you can. Um, I, like I said, it's, it's possible to convert from one bank to another. I, I just um, I think that it, the, the cost is really the, the issue in terms of risk down, 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 down the line. Um, and so I would recommend, if possible, especially if you're working with an IPSL, um, start with a GMP seed material and a GMP master cell bank. Um, embryonic stem cells is a little bit harder, but um, it is possible to take a research master cell bank make that your seed material and make a GMP master cell bank later on. Thank you, Ben. And one audience member would like to know, to your slide 18 point, how important is it to you quality by design? Um, so quality by design is essentially is the, the asking the question beforehand, how, you know, testing the parameters of, of, your, of your process. So um, it's a little bit, easier to do with a master cell bank. Really what you're looking for is you're looking for um, uh, population doublings and uh, essentially quali you're, you're controlling for, for risks and stresses in the process early on. Um, I think it's, it's important to use, but um, I don't know exactly how, how, how much work is required to do quality by design early on. I think having the good master cell bank probably feeds more directly into quality by design later on in the process so that you have a starting uh, consistent process um, and product that you can, the bank that you can use for manufacturing later on. Thank you, Ben. And why do you need a GMP cell line to make steady material for pre 
IND enabling studies? So the risk, um, well, so the request in a pre-IND, um, uh, well, in an IND submission is that you have to have shown that your material um, is number one, and most importantly, it's safe. And so the safety question for a stem cell, uh, any sort of cell which has the ability to grow and form all the other tissues, is that it could um, form a tumor. And so um, the question is that, you know, you have a master cell bank, that master cell bank is, um, where it's essentially the starting point for all things. So if you generate uh, different master cell banks, the potential is that one of them could have a different risk for, 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 for tumors or for ectopic tissue formation. So if you do your um, combination pharmacology, toxicology studies with your master cell banks, and they're not, um, they're, they're not the one that you're gonna use in, in, in patients, the FDA or some other regulatory agency is going to wonder why um, or what the other risk is. And so this is probably the, the, the biggest problem um, with, with trying to change master cell banks. You'll end up having to redo that study. Uh, so you could potentially use one master cell bank if it's GMP for your pre-IND enabling studies. But if you want to switch to another bank, you'll probably end up having to do those, those teratoma uh, toxicology studies again. And that just cuts down. It's, just, it, it's a time cost. So you could end up having to repeat human uh, clinical trial studies. So it's, I think it's really critical to get that, that done first. Thank you, and thank you to our audience members for their questions that are coming in. Then our next question is, is it important to have a MCB if the cells being used are from the source they are going back into? From, for example, from patient A back to patient A and no one else. Yeah. That's, that's so this would be essentially almost like the autologous model of, of, um, of, of cells. So if there's this question of minimal manipulation, so for example, if you're pulling cells out and you're gonna put them right back in, so for example, if you're banking blood from somebody um, for, a, for, for um, a surgery and you wanna you want make sure that they have a, a blood supply that you could infuse back into them, that's considered minimal manipulation and you won't have to, to make a master cell bank of that. But if you're going to expand those cells and you're going to change them, um, you're going to end up having to do uh, proper release on those on that product, and that release uh, panel is is expensive. I guess it really depends on the product. Um, so, for example, if you're making a pluripotent stem cell derived product, you're going to have to make a master cell bank, and you're going to have to release the master cell bank. And the the real question there is the um, the risk to the patient, um, and the risk comes from the raw material. So, uh, virus and uh, sterility can be a problem based on whatever you're, you're doing to, to expand those cells and to change them. So you'll need a master cell bank. Uh, the, the full release panel may not, be, may not be to be so extensive, but you will need a, a master cell bank. Thank you. And then does the master cell bank strategy change if the pluripotent stem cell is genetically modified? Example, expresses a transgene or has a gene edit? Oh, this is a, this is a, well, I, I love this question because it's a question I've asked before. <laughs> so um, uh, this, I, I think that, let me just preface my answer by saying, um, I don't think my answer is the only answer and I'm not sure that, it, that the FDA would agree, but I'll give you my opinion on it. And that is, um, you'd want to start with a master cell bank that was not edited, and then you would make um, essentially working banks that would be genetically modified, um, but all of that then has to be done in a GMP environment, and you have to uh, fully characterize the, the working cell bank that's genetically modified. So you may not have to, to redo all the, the viral um, testing, but you will have to do genetic stability on that, that, that working cell bank. Our next question is, we have a clean room that is not GMP. Can we manufacture our material there and use it for clinically representative pre-IND studies? So for, for a clean room that's not GMP, I think if you're making your, your working cell banks or a so-called GLP material um, that, that's gonna, that, that follows the supply chain and the batch records and the process that you use for making the end product, you can, you can manufacture material for your pre-IND studies um, that's not in a GMP environment. However, the master cell bank that does have to be GMP. Um, so at some point, you're gonna to have to make a break um, and make that GMP master cell bank. 
knowing that you can take some of those vials back to a research lab, which is clean but not GMP, and make uh, essentially development or research uh, working cell banks and uh, under GLP or, or, or sufficient quality to, to meet regulator's regular requirements, you can make your end uh, material, but you can't, you can't skip the GMP master cell bank. So I guess um, when you get into final or actual phase one manufacturing for, for patients, everything, soup to nuts, has to be done in a GMP environment. Um, but if you're making material for pre-IND enabling studies, uh, preclinical and animal studies, um, that has to start from a GMP master cell bank, but you could make it under GLP in a less uh, clean or less um, re less controlled environment for uh, IND enabling studies. Thank you, Ben, and we appreciate the live participation from our audience. We have time for a few more questions. Our next question is, what is the difference in the cost of cell culture for GMP products and for laboratory purposes? The, probably the biggest cost is um, oftentimes uh, research use only or RUO. I didn't spell that out in the talk. RUO just means research use only. Um, and a GMP product, often there's, there's very little, maybe no difference in how they're made. Um, the difference is in the, the amount of labor and time and uh, documentation that's required to differentiate between, between a, a, a GMP product or a cell therapy grade product and, and a research use only product. Um, so that's that's why there's so much more cost. It's in the human side, um, and the liability that, that that is involved in that for the for the supplier. So um, GMP reagents are just by nature more expensive because there's a lot more traceability that that goes into that. Um, the testing's more extensive, um, things like that. So when you're working in a GMP environment, the same kind of thing. It's the lab will look the same. Uh, it'll have a, an incubator. It'll have a biosafety cabinet. Um, you know, it's it, it doesn't it, it operates like any other lab would, except for the fact that you have to have uh, controlled entry, controlled exit. Um, you have to have uh, traceability in the environment. You have to have traceability on operators, traceability on all the, the machines. And so, just it, the, the expense of, of of keeping that record um, and, and keeping that cl that clean room is what causes the GMP prices to go up. Um, and it, so, in the, I guess in the short end, the, the difference is really um, traceability and human labor that's required for that, and therefore that is what increases the cost between GMP and non-GMP. Thank you for that answer. Our next question, which molecular, molecular assays do you suggest for testing genetic stability of the MCB? Right now, the, 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 the assay, which is, and it's not molecular, it's, it's, a, it's Gross morphology, essentially, uh, is is G band. G band is considered the the uh, the gold standard, and it's what's used to test for genetic stability. So um, you'll look at say 30 to 50 uh, cells, and you should see the karyotype should be normal, um, stable. A lot of groups are now starting to add in newer technologies. Um, you got whole genome sequencing. Um, you've got uh, integrations looking to see if there's any sort of, um, especially for uh, pluripotent stem cells, if there's integration of your, of your, uh, your pluripotent genes into the, the, the genome of the, the cell of interest. Um, I, I, I mean, there's, I think there's a fair amount of assays that, that you can use to give yourself comfort, to give your investors comfort, to give your patients and your physicians comfort that you have a stable line. But right now the required the requirement would be, um, would be karyotype. Thank you, Ben, and we have time for one more question. Our final question is, what are the consequences to not using a GMP master cell bank? Uh, your IND won't be approved. Uh, so you'll do a lot of work and uh, you, won't get, you, won't, you won't be able to begin clinical trials. Ben, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to share with the audience now? Uh, no. I. Well, I guess I, yes, I do. So I'd just like to thank everybody who, who came and, and, uh, and, and participated, uh, listened to our talk. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to follow up with, um, you can find us at our website, pluristics.com. And um, I look forward to um, hopefully meeting some of you in person. And if we can do anything to help you, uh, we, we'd love to help. Um, and I'd like to also thank Thermo Fisher and LabRoots for, for the time and attention today and for, for inviting me to, pre to present. This has really been fun. Thank you. And before I go, I'd like to also thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. 
questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. The webcast can be viewed on demand through August 2019. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. A poll will now pop up on your screen and your answers and your suggestions will help improve our webinar program and they are greatly appreciated. Until next time, bye-bye.